Good morning. Uh, John Hartford, Director of Ethics and Lobbying Guidance. And basically, we received some questions. Um, I'm going to go through them. And uh, we have a PowerPoint that we're going to try to use to help assist us in going through some of these questions. Um, right out of the gate, one of the questions that we got, which isn't necessarily related to the post-employment restrictions, but it's a question we get from time to time. So it seemed appropriate to address it first. It relates to the nature of the advice that we give and whether or not it's privileged. Basically, the question was, when someone calls us for advice while they're in state service, even after they leave state service, what is the nature of that interaction with us? Is it privileged? The answer to the simple question, no, it's not privileged. There are sections of the statute that speak to the confidential nature of the work that we do in the context of investigations, but more broadly, all the communications and information that we take in in fulfilling our responsibilities. Well, that was Later, 
talking about leveraging the knowledge and the contacts that they have from state service in pursuing uh, private endeavors. I often go back and read those when, because you know, all probably also know when you're applying the two-year bar, the lifetime bar, it's very easy to get in the weeds, get trapped in these phrases and understanding what they mean in a particular context. So it's oftentimes helpful for me to take a step back and reread those and say, okay, what is it we're really trying to prevent here in figuring what to do in any particular situation? Basically, this is what you already know. These are summaries of what the two-year lifetime bars are. Two-year bar, there's a two-year appearance bar. Doesn't matter whether you're compensated or not. We'll talk a lot about what it means to appear. There's a two-year bar on performing backroom services. You can always do that for free. That's one of the things we'd be doing appearing in backroom services. Here are the phrases we struggle with in applying the two-year bar, some of which we're going to be talking about today. It seems simple. Plenty of advisory is discussing exactly what these terms mean, what a state officer or employee is, which is not always straightforward, what a former agency is, because sometimes there can be more than one. There can be many former. What exactly it means to appear a practice, what it means to render services, what actually is a case proceeding or application or other matter, and what it means to actually be before your former agency. Lifetime bar. If you personally participated or gave active consideration to a case proceeding application or transaction, you can never participate regardless of compensation in that matter if that matter is before your state agency, any New York state agency, excuse me. With respect to other entities, the federal government, other states, you can participate in those matters, but you have to do it for free. Again, with respect to the lifetime bar, these are the two phrases we struggle with in applying with. What's the threshold for concluding someone has been directly concerned, personally participated, or given active consideration to something to trigger the lifetime bar? And exactly what are the limits of a case preceding application or transaction? It's a finite concept. But the very name of it, lifetime bar, how do you resolve those two things? Those are clearly case preceding application or transaction, something finite. The name of it is the lifetime bar, something that can apply for a person's entire life. So how do you resolve the tension there? Let's skip ahead. Because one of the questions that we got was asking if we could provide any guidance on what constitutes an appearance within the context of the two-year bar. Where we're talking about that. Advisory Opinion 9917. This is the one you should be familiar with when you're dealing with the two year bar question. We sort of consider this our, our North Star, so to speak. And let me take a minute to say that. Actually, this question came from Tony Coey, and I actually have a debt of gratitude to Tony, because actually it was my dealings with her that helped me really figure out what appearance means, which is why this, what we're doing right now, and every conversation I have with you guys when you call me, is absolutely mutually beneficial. There are a lot of people that have been dealing with this law longer than I have, and are more familiar with certain aspects of it than I am, and I've gotten a real education more often than not, in dealing with ethics officers and agencies and calling them with questions. And I have an initial response, and I learn a little something about how wrong I am in dealing with them. So Tony's the one that really educated me on 9917. When you read these advisory opinions up until that point in time, they really took a very broad and strict approach for what it meant to appear. Calling your former agent was considered an appearance. They didn't distinguish about what the context was, about what the purpose of the phone call was or what they were doing. That was an interaction. That was an appearance before your former agent. Any FOIL request 
of your former agency, something any other member of the public can do. That was an appearance. It got to the point where we had 9917. Essentially, 9917 deals with a request for an informal opinion, but it actually discusses a, uh, an enforcement action. One of the earlier versions of the Ethics Commission brought an action against the former Department of Transportation. An engineer, he left DOT, he went to work for an engineering firm, and he's working on a project on a road installing those reflective uh, rumble strips. He had a conversation with a member of the DOT about a load of cement, a load of concrete, and whether it could have been used or not. The Ethics Commission decides that's an appearance violation, that mere communication. They bring an action against him. They bring a judgment against him. The Article 78, the Ethics Commission, and he wins. 9917 is essentially a mea culpa. It is the Ethics Commission acknowledging the judge's decision in the Article 78 proceeding. That the way that they've been interpreting appearance was too strict and too, well, too broad. And what it comes down to is it doesn't necessarily preclude communication. They'll do this a lot in the advisory opinions. When they want to limit the two-year bar, they'll reference the language in the lifetime bar. The lifetime bar does talk about communication. They say, in contrast, it doesn't talk about communicating in the two-year bar. So clearly, any standing any communication is not authorized. It's not a reasonable interpretation of the statute. And what they boil it down to is that phrase at the bottom. The phrase appearing or practicing reaches only efforts to influence the decision of the former agency or to gain information from the agency that is not generally available to the public. It does not prescribe all contact with the agency. This is how we usually end up parsing this when we get requests for informal opinion. Actually, most often in the context of former DOT people, engineers, who leave state service, and really the only job opportunities in the private sector involve their, that's within their expertise, building roads. DOT is invariably going to be involved in that in some capacity. So we do not interpret the two-year bar to prescribe any contact, but they have to be mindful. We usually apply a number of conditions that they have to be careful about what the interaction was. They never interact in a manner that someone could be said. It could be said that they're attempting to influence how that agency exercises its discretion. And that can be attempting to influence how that understand, the agency understands a particular set of facts. The agency is conducting an investigation. You're not advocating a particular position, but you're advocating a particular set of facts and dealing with that agency. Well, that's the kind of thing with the agency. Even if it's not necessarily a conversation about what ultimate decision should be reached and how the discretion should be exercised, how they're going to do it is going to be informed by their understanding of the facts of a particular situation. So if that DOT inspector, the person who leaves DOT and becomes an inspector, He's working on a particular job, and he's writing up reports, and it's all in-house for the contractor. But there becomes a moment where there's a dispute. And now his recitation of the facts is what's offered to DOT in trying to resolve that dispute back to concrete appearance, back to cross one. But as I said, attempting to influence is uh, what we look to in evaluating whether or not an interaction with someone leaves state service constitutes a prohibited appearance. There are a lot of advisories that sort of try to distinguish as to where that line is. So here's some obvious examples of the prohibited appearances, working on an application, going before your former agency, negotiating a contract, participating in a field audit, submitting grant applications when you're trying to get money from your former agency. Submitting periodic status reports or a final report on finding the billing. These are all instances where the agency is going to be exercising its discretion in determining what to do. And the idea is if they see your name on it, they're going to be showing deference to you and you're going to be getting an unwarranted report. Submitting a resume to the former agency for approval on a work bit. That's again one of those conditions we put in when you have a former DOT employee who's going to work for a private contract. One of the questions they have to ask you. Does DOT have to review and sign off on all the people participating in the project? Are they going to be looking at your resume and showing you deference in granting such an approval? It's 
participating in an administrative proceeding, one that's before your former agency, it's a different rule than before a different agency. Again, settlement discussions with the former agency. Discussing a proposed project or application with the former agency and participating in settlement or discussions with the former agency. I believe that was an opinion where people were saying, well, can I do all the work while my two-year bar is still in place, but not actually go before the agency until after my two-year bar is up? Well, no, that's a little too clever. That's a little too cute. You're still doing back those services. It's a problem. Here's an important one. The agency can always rehire the former employee. People get very mad at me when I suggest that that's an option, when they're calling me because they want to have a consulting agreement with the former employee because they need them for something. And we have to discuss the process, whether or not it's a question the commission asks on AP exemption applications, whether or not there was any conversation about rehiring employees. But you can't engage in a consulting agreement with the former employee to provide the same services they were giving the state service without an A-B exemption application, something we'll talk about a little bit later. Again, this is more along the line. 99 out of 13 <laughs> prohibits a former DOC employee from accepting a position with a private company and overseeing the company's contract with DOC because the work would require the former employee to make a repeated prohibited appearances before the former agent. Again, this is a situation like the DO, former DOT engineer, where it involves them appearing. The duties they're going to have in that private capacity it involve interacting with the agency in a way attempting to influence that former agency is prohibited. The last one sort of dovetails with the notion that you can have more than one former agency comes up mainly in the context of MTA employees who work for MTA but may have responsibilities that go to Long Island Railroad or the city transit. You can have more than one former agency. The bar applies to all of the ones that are designated as former agency. Here's the tough one uh, that we struggle with. Suppose you generate a document. You're working in a private capacity. You're interacting with an, an agency that is not your former agency. Generating work product, it's got your name on it, it's obvious it's your work product. If it is reasonably foreseeable that that work product is in turn going to end up before your former agency, that you work for DEC, and now you're out in the private sector and you, your company has a contract with a different state agency, but due to regulation or state law or just policy and practice, you know that that state agency is going to go to DEC and ask them to weigh in, to review, have an opinion about whatever it is you generated, that can constitute a prohibited appearance. It's about what's reasonably foreseeable. And when you read the advisories and they're trying to define what reasonably foreseeable is, that's what they look to. Is there a statute? Is there a regulation? Is there a policy and practice that you as a former employee of that agency should be aware of that you know? your work product is going to end up in front of your former agency, even if it's passing through a different state agency, that becomes a problem. Ninety twenty-one. You can't perform services for a private entity funded by your former agency if the agency has a role in approving you as the employee. If they don't, I'm sorry, go ahead. Funded by, does that mean, again, a contract? Funded by, or funded by? Either by, either, well, I think the, the context I'm usually talking about that is a grant. Mm -hmm. Whether it is a state agency that is giving state money or it's a pass-through for federal money. Okay. It's permissible to do the work unless as part of that grant, your former agency is reviewing your work, approving it, or even just approving you as an employee of that entity. It comes up a lot of times in the context of someone who leaves and wants to provide training to their former agency or another agency. They go to work for a nonprofit. 
the agency is required to provide a certain kind of training by statute. They contract out with the private entity to provide the training. As long as the agency isn't dictating what the training is, doesn't have approval over the training, as long as they're not approving you as a former state employee to provide that training, you can do it. If they do play a role in that, then they have to exercise some discretion. Let me see this person present here. Let me see the qualifications to do this training. Let me see the curriculum they've come up with and whether or not we approve of it. Now you cross the line into a prohibited report. And that's where they, they, they drop it down. But that's a tricky one where most people aren't even thinking in those terms when they're considering another job. Whether what the product's actually going to end up. It comes up. Okay. So let me know when you think. Yeah, I sign. This is more talking about reasonably foreseeable, a reasonable foreseeability standard. And it has to be something actual in real life, <laughs> a law regulation, not, not a crystal ball. But they know it's going to end up in front of the former agency. I'll turn this back to Patrick. Ninety-nine three. So they articulate this standard about foreseeability, and then they find themselves in a situation where they have to apply it to an investigation. So the person leaves the attorney general's office, and they're working for a private entity, and they're participating in an investigation. There's no idea what an investigation is going to be. You never know. There's no statute that governs it. There's no. So basically, 99.3 is an acknowledgment that this rule they've created about work product has its limitations. And here's an instance where you can't reasonably or see where the agency is going to go, or where the investigation is going to go. Uh, once you're at that point, there may be recusal. General information. These are examples of what is. You can use your training and experience and knowledge from your state service when you leave. It's just for two years, you can't use it on a specific matter. So if a person leaves state service, they want to work for a private entity, and the private entity says, hey, can you do me a favor? I want you to put something together on generally how your former agency operates. What are their policies? What is the practical matter? What is, what's the path, the procedures that they follow? To give us an idea what we're dealing with generally when we're dealing with your former agency. You can do that. The problem becomes when they come to you and say, right, we have this specific matter. We're getting ready to go before your former agency. That helps help us strategize with how to get there. Help us work on that particular application to shepherd it through. That becomes a problem. Which is essentially what 9003 and 904 set out. Subpoenas, obviously, if you're subpoenaed to appear before your former agency, there's not much you can do except comply with a subpoena. That's the easy one. Here's the training one that I spoke about before. Teaching, of course, before your former agency required by statute to provide it. If you're not appearing, your agency has nothing to do with approving you as a trainer or the curriculum that you are using. Here's what we talked about in terms of federal funding, pass through funds. Funds are just passing through this, your former agency. They have no discretion in how those funds, whether it's proving you or how that's done, so they can be said you're exercising influence. That's not considered a prohibited interference. It's a strange one where they're inconsistent. Certifications and licenses. These are two instances where a former employee could not appear before their former agency. One was someone who worked for DMV as an inspector, one of the leading started driving school. Well, the people that would have been licensing him and regulating him for those first two years were his buddies at DMV. They basically said he had to put his plans on hold for two years, not just because they didn't like him, but regulating him. Same thing happened in the case. Uh, 9803, the person who wanted to run a racetrack after leaving the New York State Racing and Weight Training Board. 
the other way you do it. It was more than just licensing, it was regulating. However, they saw that this could be taken too far. This rule was too near far. But say you have an OPWDD employee or in the second one a DOH employee who in order to practice their profession needs to be certified or recertified by their former agent. They carved out an exception here. Obviously, you can't prevent these people from making a living. So in those instances, they focus a lot on the fact that it's a recertification, so it's almost ministerial. And they carve out this exception in those instances um, to allow those people to actually go on and do some work when they get state service. But it would be overly broad and unduly burdensome to apply the two-year bar in those situations. And the same was true in, in, in 9523. Essentially what they said was, uh, DOT may be approving the minority business enterprise certification, but they're really just applying a federal program. There's a path for, for that program. So it wasn't considered an appearance. But the agency wasn't exercising discretion. They were following the guidelines set by the federal government. Here's how we end up parsing FOIL requests. You can make a FOIL request as a former employee on your own behalf. You can't do it for somebody else for two years. Apparently, agencies exercise some discretion in determining what fits within FOIL, what fits within an exception, how hard they're going to fight to keep that stuff from you. Because the agencies exercise the discretion in how it does that, that's how they split the baby in the Litigation. This is a very, I find this probably the most bizarre of them all. When they come down to this, you're a lawyer, you leave the attorney general's office, and your client wants to hire you. You have to explain to your client that once it goes to court, you can appear in court. You can appear in front of the judge because that's not a matter before the agency. But as far as calling the attorney general beforehand to try to work something out, having conversations about possible discovery, conversations about possible settlement, you can't do that. The two-year bar would apply to those activities, but not necessarily appearing in court. You can go to court. I don't know who's ever going to hire somebody under those circumstances, but that's how they split it. It's under the notion that if you're in court, you're in front of the judge, you're not in front of the agency, you have this independent auditor, and there's really no opportunity to exercise influence. The opportunity to exercise influence is in the negotiations about discovery and settlement. Any questions on the appearance issue? All right, now what? Yeah. The agency means just the agency. It doesn't refer to anything broader than that. For example, if it's an agency that's overseen by part of the executive office. I hate giving this awful lawyer answer that always begins with it. There's a whole series of slides in here. The question was, when you talk about former agency, is it just the former agency or does it extend beyond that? And again, this goes to this idea of what is your former agency. Um, in answer to the other questions in here that are going to touch on this, but you can have more than one former agency. There's two ways they parse this in trying to figure out a former employee's former agency agencies. The first is what they call their duty-based analysis. And they look at, all right, this individual employee, what were their daily responsibilities? Like I said, it most often comes up in the context of the MTA. So the MTA, the Long Island Railroad, Metro North, New York City Transit, these are all separate entities. However, if I'm working for MTA, my daily responsibilities might include regular interaction with the Long Island Railroad or, or New York City Transit. Maybe I'm working for MTA, but I'm in charge of the east side access. So I'm interacting with these people. I'm developing all the same contacts, all the same insider information with respect to how that other entity works so that those would both be my former agency. It happens with ITS as well. They have, tend to have clusters that they work with. They get assigned to some of their employees. So they'll have, you know, the, um, the public sector security. They'll have, you know, state police, docs, parole. So 
those are the entities that they work with. So looking at what their duties are, their former agency might be ITS and three or four other agencies, depending upon what they were doing on a daily basis. So it can extend beyond that. The other way they look at it is they look at a function-based analysis uh, and determine whether or not, so one of the examples is the Tax Board of Appeals within the Division of Tax. When they look at those they technically, the Division of the Tax Board of Appeals is housed under taxation and finance. However, there's an advisory where they look at exactly how it functions, literally where these people are reporting to work, how they are funded, what the structure is in terms of how the decisions are made, and they wrote an opinion saying, listen, it might be housed within tax, but it's essentially functionally a separate entity. So if you work for the division of tax, you're not necessarily barred when you leave from the period before the tax board of appeals. So this is something set fun. There are other instances on employment insurance where they did the same analysis and concluded, no, that's not independent from the Department of Labor, but it's housed within it. If you work for the Department of Labor, it extends the unemployment insurance to employees. So it depends. It can be more than one form. It, your former agency can be more than one entity, and it might be more narrow than you think under certain circumstances. It depends on the facts of how the agency is structured and also what you're doing. Hmm? Fun? Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Did I get there? No? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. Is that a question? Uh oh, uh oh, per diem. The question is, how the post-employment restrictions affect per diem employees? In 73, when they define state employee or officer, they specifically exclude uncompensated members of boards or per diem employees. So none of these rules would apply to people that are appointed and are not compensated serving on boards, commissions, things like that, councils, or per diem, people that are compensated uh, per diem for their work. It's specifically excluded in the definition of 73. It's not excluded from the definition of 74. So of the most as well, 74 still applies to all those folks. If you thought my conversation on appearance was fun and stimulating, we're going to talk about what it means, this phrase means the same transaction. The question is, particularly interested in guidance on the meaning and breadth of the same transaction as the prescription of the lifetime bar. When I read that question, my First thought was, so would I. <laughs> oh. This is the question we struggle with the most, that we find the most difficult, the most challenging. Here's a perfect example of why. This is a quote from 9506. Question as to whether a case proceeding application or transaction remains the same hinges upon whether, despite all the intervening events, the essence of the transaction is subject and purpose to parties interested and effective and the ultimate goal remains constant. Who wants to take a stab at what the meaning of the word essence is? Could there be any word that has greater pot potential for reasonable people to disagree on what essence? And even in itself, where it attempts to give a little more guidance, the subject and purpose, the parties interested and affected, and the ultimate goal remains the same. All of those things can change over time. <laughs> so how much do each one of those factors have to change? How many of them have to change before it's not the same essence anymore? Do I seem a little annoyed? <laughs> <laughs> it's not easy. And I'll be perfectly honest. The lifetime bar is pretty harsh. And there are opinions out there that talk about not wanting it to be overly broad. Well, we take that to heart. And honestly, when we get a lifetime bar question, if I'm being completely honest, my instinct is to find a way that it doesn't apply. I go to the advisories looking for a way it shouldn't have to apply. And only when I'm completely constrained by what the advisories say do I say the lifetime bar applies. But, 
and you come, and someone comes to you and you see a lifetime bar issue, probably the same thing with appearance. Dump it on us. Seriously, these are situations where reasonable people can disagree. Your idea of what the appearance is is probably very different from mine. Same with the lifetime bar and whether something is the same transaction. Case proceeding the application. Put that judgment call on us. That's something I didn't say about the advice that we give. When we write an informal opinion and give it to somebody, we don't share it with anybody, but that person can take it and share it with whomever they want. In particular, someone who comes along after the fact and says they disagree and think there's been a violation. That opinion gives them safe harbor. They can wave that around and say, I thought of this, I asked, I checked, they said this was okay. Go away. So dump that on us. But it's our opinion, we're the ones that are criticized for it, not you. So God forbid, you give that advice, you put it in writing, they take it to heart, and we do end up with it. That's why we exist, so you guys don't have to carry that weight. Um, related to this, I'm just curious as to whether or not this has ever been challenged in court and what the court found, if there, if there are any opinions. If, if someone disagreed with when you found that there was a lifetime bar, and, I'm, and I mean, I'm, I'm guessing that's why it's not, um, you know, it says it can't be overly broad and restrictive because we know that in court you can't, you know, state and federal law say you can't do that. So I'm just curious if anyone challenged it. Oh. It's been challenged. Okay. We won. Yeah. But it has been challenged. But I'll talk about that in a minute. I'll get to that. Because that's an important exception, and I think it may go to what goes on at night. Where's my beginning? Okay, that's not just quote. Here's them taking this essence to heart. So 91.12, former state employee, works on a building project, a rehab project. No question that he actively participated, personally participated in it, but he leaves. <coughs> the thing is, they pick those plans, they throw them out. They completely do a redesign from the initial plan. The new plan couldn't be any different. Same transaction. The essence is the same construction of that building, so it's the same transaction. Doesn't matter that everything he worked on is now gone. They consider it to be the same transaction. The essence of it hasn't changed. It's another broad interpretation. State administered program that affect the same or substantially the same population, provided substantially the same services, and have the same goal of the same transaction even if the funding sources and procedures are considerably different. Another one appraisal of the same piece of real estate. The employee, part of their job, appraises a piece of land. Years later, I think it's 10 years later in that case, they're in private practice, they're asked to appraise the same piece of property that's related to state business. Basically what they held was, yeah, 10 years have passed, technically a new appraisal, but land doesn't change that much over time. And it's essentially the same process you went through when you were in state service, same transaction. Another good one. The whole line of advisory is to talk about it being the same transaction if what we might normally think is a subsequent transaction was dependent upon, a continuation of, contemplated by, or in relation to the prior transaction. So here's a former state employee who helps draft legislation while in state service. They leave state service, that legislation goes nowhere in that session. Two years later, it's resurrected, there's some changes made to it, and it passed. Now this person's in private practice, they're working for a nonprofit, and they want to work on the regulation to implement that statute. Same transaction. Legislation hadn't changed enough such that you could conclude this person wasn't deriving a benefit from having been on the inside in the executive chamber and something like this piece of legislation. Same transaction. I 
said before when I talked to you earlier about the lifetime bar, it can apply to what you do even outside the state. You gave active uh, consideration of a person participating in the matter. Here we have a New York City Transit employee who works on evaluating a new train system while he's in state service. He leaves and he now he wants to work on a federal program that's going to be adopting and reviewing that design he worked on while he was in state service, working for the transit. Lifetime barred, same transaction because it's in relation to the matter that he worked on. So I shouldn't say matter. The transaction case that he worked on while he was in New York City transit. And you have 9709, which actually boggles my mind. This is a guy who worked for DOT, he's an engineer. One of these road projects that's going to take 30 years, most of their projects. Initially, it's conceived as one project. And he works on it at that point, helping design the project as an engineer. Subsequent to that, the project's broken up into three phases. What I mean subsequent, we're talking about about 10 years in between all these things happen. Broken up into three phases. He works on phase one. Now he leaves state service. Now it's 10 years later, 20 years after he did the original work on it when it was one big project. He wants to work on stage three. Nope, can't do it. Lifetime bar. Because it was originally contemplated as one project when he worked on it. What benefit this man is getting 20 years later? Escapes me. But there is an advisory that says that is the same transaction. feeling my pain now. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, here's a little bit of good news. Instances where they say this thing is a separate transaction. Successive utility rate proceedings before the Public Service Commission. Because they each one deals with substantially different factual situations, changes in operating finance costs, consumer demand, these are all can, can be considered sufficiently different deem them separate transactions. They say the same thing about the budget, too, every year. Sufficiently different year to year that it's considered the same. Whether that actually holds up to scrutiny, I'm not going to ask, because they're saying it's separate. Same situation in 9515. Preparing cost indices in obsolescence studies for obsolete property. Basically, they're saying every time they do this, they're doing it new. They're doing it fresh. They're not relying on anything that happened before in prior year reports. So they're going to call it a separate transaction. Even if you worked on one while you were in state service and then you're in private practice, it's the next year. You're not deriving any benefit from having worked on the last one other than the experience of doing it. Ninety-six twelve. There's another one where they they found a distinction between. Someone who worked on building a solid waste facility and later working on an effort to expand it. And one of the reasons they said it was a separate transaction was it wasn't originally contemplated when they built the facility in the first instance. And that there's ladders not dependent upon nor an actual expected continuation of the prior permit. 9619. It's a matter before the PSC that they worked on establishing general principles that were going to govern the restructure of the electricity industry. Basically what they said is working on general guidelines and principles applies to regulations in certain contexts too. Does not prevent you from then going out and giving advice on specific matters involving the application of those principles or those regulations. The same thing applies to methodology, although I'll talk about that in a little more detail. Ninety-six twenty-seven was an expert who worked for DEC. He was apparently world renowned. There was a spill on the Hudson. He was working on the cleanup. He leaves, he goes to a university. They desperately need this guy continue working on this cleanup. He's the only game in town. So they come up with this ridiculous notion that part of the spill that they discovered a little bit further down the Hudson was somehow separate and distinct from the spill. This would be the perfect subject of an A-B application. 
right? They would just apply and say, look, maybe it violates the post-employment restrictions, but we need this guy. There's a compelling reason. He's the only game in town, and they get permission to use it. I thought this one was a little bit of a stretch. Another area to look for ways to distinguish cases, transactions, proceedings, applications. If there have been technological advancements in new standards that are sufficiently different from what they were when the state employee was in state service, you can draw a distinction and say there's a separate transaction. This has come up in the context of uh, the Metro card technology, which has changed substantially over time. Um, there's a, one of these deals with the, yeah, the first one, a road weather system, um, and then there's a, a lottery. Where basically every few years, these things have to keep up with the changes in technology. And the question becomes, for a lawyer who has no knowledge of this stuff, whether or not they change technologically enough that we can conclude there's no reasonable basis to infer that the former state employee is deriving a benefit from having worked on it while in state service. We struggle with that, uh, whether or not something's changed in it, honestly. How we make those judgments. We struggle making those judgment calls. I don't know anything about Metro Card and the technology and how much it's changed. You know, and, and it comes up. It comes up. Another example would be, say, um, the Farley Post Office. They've been talking about extending the railroad into the far into that post office for 30 years. First, they were going to put a couple of rail lines in. Over the course of 30 years, now they're taking over the whole building. The building's been sold. Now the Monahan. There's different state actors and federal actors involved in that project. The way it's going to be funded is different. Everything about that project has changed over the last 30 years. So if you were the first guy in 1997 tossing around the idea of throwing a couple of rails in there to extend Penn Station, I don't see how we could conclude that today that's the same project, that it's changed. So yes, admittedly, sometimes it feels like we're throwing darts at a dartboard figure out where that line is. But this is one way in which you can separate uh, transactions that the essence seems to be the same. Methodology. The development of a non-confidential methodology by the state employee should not act as a lifetime bar transaction and prevent the employee from applying that methodology to other uses that he or she needs. Sir. Again, I said, here's that magical language that we hang our hat on. They've acknowledged in these advisories that a contrary holding would result in an overly broad application of the law. Okay. So what I found interesting is when first, someone first told me there's an exception for methodology, immediately I thought, okay, this is intended for scientists. And these scientists whose life work began before they joined state service, we hoodwinked them into coming to work for us, God bless them. And we don't want to hamstring them now, continuing this important work when they leave. It has to be no. The advisories that deal with this talk about people they come up with. Look at the first one. Methodology for maximizing Medicaid reimbursement to the state. This was someone whose expertise was really mainly in dealing with the New York City schools in evaluating how many of the children might qualify for Medicaid services and coming up with a methodology for identifying them, applying, figuring out what those federal services might be, applying for them and getting funding. They then leave, they want to work for a nonprofit, that profit, nonprofit wants to bring that methodology and apply it to the other schools throughout the state, the other public schools throughout the state. They said he could do that. He's just applying the methodology. He's not applying it in New York City. He's applying it out so there's no inference. He's capitalizing on relationships or insider knowledge of how the New York City school system works. He can go do that through. They say the same thing for the development of training. They say it's akin to using a methodology. I would think it would also apply to people that do research. People that say, I don't know, will come and are leaving. I can't imagine us telling somebody they got stuck working on stem cell research because they left the state. I can't that. I don't want to see that part of the second institution. We'll be crushed. Having said that, here's a matter of more. 
the other guy who helped work on implementing a methodology for Medicaid reimbursement. He leaves. He's working for an entity that wants to challenge that methodology in court. And he submits an expert affidavit pointing out all the flaws in the work he had done while he was in state <laughs> service. <laughs> That's no good. He got penalized for it. He took an Article 78. The court agreed with us. That's a little too cute. But yes, you can, and this is where it comes down. Yes, you can work on applying regulations that you help write. However, if that work involves challenging or, in the case of 9624, amending those regulations, those are six circumstances where it can be said you're trying to profit from your insider knowledge. So we use one of the people in the room, you know what the conversations were, what the real intent was behind the regulations, and where the holes are. That's no good. Um, would there be a difference between um, working on regulations or working on, say, successor legislation? Say the, the legislation sunsetted and the new legislation being drafted. Uh, the question is, would that extend to working on new legislation? Hmm. I don't know. But you have those opinions that say working on a new budget, that's a new transaction. You're not But if you're relying, and I guess it's the same in both cases, if you're relying on experience with the first version or the first budget or the first legislation to suggest improvement um, or to yeah, promote improvement, is that the same transaction? Certainly you can make an argument that, that yeah, they have this better knowledge. But if the idea is that new legislation, because the priorities have changed or they realize the error and flaws in the old. It's amazing to see the situation where the people that might be best qualified to do the work are the people who might be most qualified. My inclination would be to see it as a new transaction. I think that comes down to how we try to make sense of very different opinions so that it doesn't exclude people who are in the best position but I don't think we've had that question. I don't think we have anyone specifically on that with that So good question I thought honestly I'm not sure. But that would be my inclination to say that it's a new separate transaction. All right. I just put these up here in all humility. Please, this makes me throw my hands up sometimes. Here's someone who works for the Public Service Commission. As part of their duties, they help create a New York State Reliability Council. They immediately leave state service and they want to be on that council. They say, no, you're barred. You would think it would be a lifetime bar. That was the matter that they worked on helping to create. Now they want to sit on it. They personally participated in the same matter, same thing, transaction. The commission says, no, you can't, but only because it's in its formative stage. Thank you. Come back to us a little later. And he comes back a year later. That's 99.15. said, okay, it's not formative anymore. And they go through this very lengthy analysis of all the things that the New York State Reliability Council has done to get up and running. And say, no, it's now in its operational stage. Go with God. Stay on the count. So, yes, it seems a little arbitrary, I think, because it is. And I know it's in the statute, but how does whether you're a volunteer or a um, paid employee affect this? Or is that only the two-year bar that's affected by it? No, 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 actually, then that's another question that we got from someone else. Um, I'm going to see where I have it in my slide. I can wait. Well, we're going to get to it, I promise. Because it's a good question. Yeah, it's one that's been coming up with me. But um, you must be tired of my voice at this point, so I'm going to give the next question to Carol. Mm -hmm. Okay.
Okay, so I guess the first thing I would just repeat is, so we're trying to do things in a reasonable way and apply some things that sometimes are, are tricky. I'm dealing with an area here that I think is fairly straightforward. Uh, we have some questions on the 30-day rule, so and, and how that applies. And I think the trickiest part of that is whether it's a specific pending matter in front of you. But I, so John and I have both been here about a year, so we, we tried to become experts quickly. And I do recall being the attorney of the day, like the first week or two when I got here, and I'm thinking I'm ready, and then I get a question on the 30-day rule, and I can't find it. I've never heard of it. I don't know where it is. So. The 30-day rule is not necessarily written in statute or regulation, but it emanates from an advisory opinion, and it's 1601. And it deals with when you're in state service, what happens if someone that you have a pending matter before either asks you for a job and you have no interest in leaving, you've never thought about it, but all of a sudden they're talking, they like you, they're going to try to solicit you to come over to their side. Or you like them and you think, well, you know, I've gotten to know them and I, I, I'd, I'd like to an opportunity. So 0601, I don't even think there was a case before us at the time. It was just guidance that we issued to deal with it. And um, you're really talking, it, 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 it's based in, when I said it's based in statute, the promise of future employment can be considered a gift under 735. It also could uh, implicate 74, whether you're, you can you know, do your duties essentially discharge your duties without a conflict of interest. If you want the job, you might plot, you know, tend to be, you, you certainly could appear that you're giving them a beneficial answer because you'd like them to give you a beneficial job. So 0601, I think it's fairly straightforward. Okay, so there's a rule. Um, and like I said, this part is very straightforward. And I'll deal with, the only issue is the specific pending matter. I'll get to that in a second. But if you have, let's, you know, I'll deal with what that is. Let's say you have a pending matter in front of you. You have to, and they, they solicit you. You're going to have to tell your ethics officer at that point, refuse yourself, and if you want to pursue it, wait 30 days. Um, and, and that's the rule. And so, or let's say you have something in front of you and they haven't asked you, but you're thinking you might want something. You have to wait 30 days from whatever matter that is that's closed before you can pursue it. Um, there was a question on, well, what happens if I know there's a job, maybe it's posted somewhere, and the deadline for submitting a resume is within 30 days. Fortunately, you'd be out of luck on that one. That's, you know, this is pretty straightforward. And, and, and you know, there's really, unfortunately, no way around that. You've missed, missed the boat on that. You have to wait the 30 days. You have to tell your ethics officer if you get the offer. Or if you're pursuing it, you have to wait the 30 days and, and back off and refuse. And, and I think that's fairly straightforward. I don't know how much um, in detail uh, we have to get on that. You know, there, is, there are violations. We could get you under, like I said, the, the gift violation. Or we could get you under 74. Um, so the, I think the trickier part is specific matter. So there was uh, another advisory opinion. Go ahead. I had a question. This kind of has to come up in my agency, and um, I had somebody call me and say, I've been offered a job, and I went through the whole thing, and I told them how she had to refuse, and I told them she had to put it in writing to me and to the supervisor and everything else. And it was kind of one of these open-ended job offers, like we're thinking about doing this, and if, we, and if it comes to fruition, we'd really like to hire you. And I ended up with a supervisor on the phone a couple of times saying, look, I've had to take over this person's duties vis-a-vis -vis this agency, and kind of how long does it go on? Um, you know, what I said was, for so long as that is a viable job offer, we have to restructure this person's duties. But I'm just wondering if it's kind of like, uh, yeah, we're thinking about it. Is there some middle ground where you can jump back in, or do you need to stay out for the duration? So the question, just to repeat, is what happens if the job opportunity is kind of a little open-ended, they're, they're discussing a job opportunity, and you don't know when the interviews are going to be, you don't know how how that's going to be, and, and then I look at me, I've accused myself, and now my supervisor has to take over my job with that 
party for quite some time, which is kind of difficult. And I think your, your, your answer was a correct answer. And again, this is more of a reasonable interpretation. If there's a you know, job opportunity posted and listed, and they're looking actively to fill it, I think you have to refuse until until the decision is made on the job. Now, that the refusal would be only if the government employee, the agency employee, were actually interested in the job, as opposed to, I would never go to work with this company under any circumstances. They're just gaming me, thinking that they're going to disqualify me uh, by offering me a job. I mean, if you have to be actually interested in the job, perhaps the refusal issue uh, arises. You still have to report it, probably, but uh, the right, refusal part right, would be it. not applicable. Not, not indefinitely. If you're not pursuing it, you're not interested, and you've been told and you've waited for 30 days, I, I would say that, I'm not, that hasn't come up before I've been on job, but that, that's, that's the, um, the answer I would, you know, because you're right, they could, maybe they don't like your answer, maybe they think you're a little too strict in whatever you're doing in front of them, that could be a way I don't know if people would actually do that. Oh, they do. Well, okay. Okay. <laughs> Do 
was a question about whether, I'm sorry, I don't know if you covered it, about whether or not um, that would extend to sort of casual networking that people do. The course of their employment, maybe they have a, someone that they work with that was a, former, a mentor of theirs. But now that they're working in state service, their agency deals with that person in their private capacity. What are the limitations on it? And again, this goes back to what we were talking about in terms of a specific pending matter. I think that this can't be applied so broadly as to prevent people from networking, obviously. And it sort of, and it goes back to the question of you know, what's the agency's obligation. Ultimately, it's always the individual's obligation to comply with the public office as well. Agencies have a stake in it. They're a stakeholder because it's their reputation. And they don't want to don't want the bad press, they also want to see this person run afoul of the law, but ultimately it's the individual's responsibility. And I would reinforce with anybody that it's up to them to use their judgment in determining when the, the sort of a general networking, professional networking, crystallizes into something more specific. You know, they're because they're sending you in a specific direction for a job, maybe not even necessarily with them, but identifying the potential conflict where they are conferring some form of benefit on you in terms of future employment directly to specific agencies. I'm not hiring, but the law firm down the street is, and I'll put in a good word for you. That can happen. I think that would fall into something like this, if that individual now has a matter before you. So in, in, in some measure, it has to be sort of common sense in terms of how it's applied. Going back to the prior piece that I think I've, I've got questions about how they apply when it's a matter of a contract. In other words, I can say if you're negotiating, you can't. To negotiate a contract, which is one of the things you need to do in practice. But if you're working on a contract, in fact, you can even do the same contract you write. And if you worked on, you, you, you carried out and you supervised it, or you simply worked on it, and you later want to go to the contractor and work on the same contract, but you're not going to be, you're going to be, I mean, obviously you're appearing in the sense that you're doing the work for the agency. So, and yet, and if it's, but it's not a matter, it's not a specific transaction. Well, I think if it's within two years, you're also looking at the back of the services clause. Well, that's true. Okay. Which would come in to sort of capture that activity, mm -hmm. depending upon what you're doing. Um, if it's something ministerial, maybe there's an argument to be made that you're not attempting to influence the decision about how you're doing it. You still have back from services also about not necessarily attempting to influence, but capitalizing on right. well, that's true. the experience that you have. They're bringing you in to do this because you literally worked up the, from the other side and you know that perspective. So you have that insider knowledge that you're capitalizing on doing that. There may even be a lifetime bar argument to be made with the contract that you work with. Because while there is the negotiation of the contract, which is probably the most significant moment, as the contract's being played out, there's all kinds of opportunities where the disputes arise that have to be resolved in the performance of that contract. And I think that's what I was saying earlier, where even if you're the person just offering up a recitation of the facts that you're asking the agency to accept in resolving the dispute, you're attempting to influence them. You're trying to get them to diverge your version of events. I would think that could be seen as an attempt to influence. So that might hit all three in terms of being a problem scenario that you put forth. And I just want to touch, I had a question that came in. Um, to what extent is it the former agency's responsibility to know what the former employees are doing? You don't have a responsibility. The former employee that has the responsibility. As I said just a moment ago, the agency obviously has its own interest in preserving its reputation and the integrity of how it performs its responsibilities. But ultimately, it's incumbent on that former employee. And we do get referrals quite a bit with respect to post-employment restrictions from agencies. They're in the best position to know and realize when there's a potential post violation of the post-employment restriction. So while I would encourage agencies to do that, I can't claim that the agencies have any legal responsibility to do that. Yeah, we have an advisory opinion that says it does not matter if, if we were doing, I have a two-year bar, you're doing something within that two-year bar, it doesn't matter if the agency knows you are. If you're doing it, it's your responsibility. So we do, we do have, and we put that in a lot of our advice, that it doesn't matter if the agency knows that you worked on it. If it's a 
tobacco and service violation and tobacco and service violation. That time you're not on the agency to know that you did it. So, so any more questions on either of those topics before I transfer into the student exception, full-time student exception? Another here? So we did get some questions from the Department of Transportation regarding the two-year ban as it relates to full-time students or recently graduated students who now are working there, and that's, that's going to make a difference. Uh, so one of the questions we got was, given JCO's guidance regarding students and the current definition of a full-time student, we advise full-time students working for DOT on a temporary basis not to accept any paid benefits, including death benefits, if they wish to be exempt from the two-year ban. Is this correct or are we being too strict? So we have uh, an advisory opinion 9101. Uh, the answer is no, you're not being too strict. Uh, there are 9101 came down with uh, a set of factors. It lays out a set of factors because it was trying to make a distinction when you're a prime, when your focus is really fewer students, you might happen to work get some experience at an agency or government agency. We don't want to have uh, the post-employment restrictions apply to you. So then you, you work at DOT or DOT for a little bit to help you get experience and build your resume and maybe get your school and pay for school. We don't want you and then not be able to work for that agency. So these are the factors. Um, and they're fairly straightforward. You have to be a full-time student, you know, at an accredited course of study. That's fairly obvious. You can usually figure that out. Uh, you can't work more than 50 percent or more during the week. So two and a half days a week, whatever that might be. They do then acknowledge that during the summer, and everyone does this in the summer, they're not in school, but will work full time. So you can work full time during the summer or a similar semester or break time, or, you know, holiday break. Uh, they have a limit on how many hours. It's 120 days or four months. Uh, so if you can, be, so basically, you can go to school full time, you can work part time uh, there, and also do the summer. Those are your factors. Is there a fourth one or no? Oh, I got it. Okay. All right. So uh, then there was another advisory opinion that we issued. 0902, which addressed a scenario that wasn't contemplated in the first one. Uh, and, and this was whether uh, paid student interns are state employees by virtue of the fact that they have to pay past dues and receive a past benefit. This is required of them working there. So we decided that, well, the thing we take from most of this is you're looking at all the factors. And one of them was, one of the factors, which I'm not sure I said, was that you receive benefits, okay? That was one of the factors in there. This case, or this advisory opinion, basically acknowledges that this is not, you don't have to check every, every it's not a checkbox. You don't have to get all four. If this person they decided was still uh, eligible for the student exception, we'll call it, uh, because they otherwise met the criteria of a student. So even though they had their acceptance test benefits, they're not going to say that person now is subject And that, so, so we, we take that to mean, and, we, and we've had this come up where uh, it might have been the Department of Health, part of their graduate study program, you have to work, you know, for one of the semesters, let's say you have to work three days a week, and that's just the way it is. Well, under the factors, that would say, okay, sorry, you're not, you're not going to get the exception. You're more, you're more of a worker than a full-time student. And so we use 0902 uh, as a way of getting around that. And, and, and you're really... The essence of that is, is their primary function of student, are they a full-time student? And I think that's fairly easy to understand using the four factors. And again, it's not necessarily necessary to check all four. You're kind of trying to figure out, are they really a full-time student or not? Yeah. Is, is it the mandatory nature of these things to have acceptance and that makes it, that takes it out of the, the checklist? That's what, that's what the, um, and that's what we, you know, again, that person had to, had to get the test benefits, they had to pay the test dues, and again, the other student, the graduate student, had to work the three days. 
I don't think if you voluntarily work three days and try to call yourself a student, the outcome will be the same. Um, but that's a good question. So I think that's all we have. Uh, there's another question we had, number two. Another question we had was with regard to recent, and this is now someone has graduated, recent college graduates that accept a temporary position at the Department of Transportation while they're looking for long-term work. Now they're, they've graduated, and the answer is yes, unfortunately, yes. So that person who maybe worked there all through college or all through graduate study, now doesn't have a job yet, wants to continue on with the same, same situation. Unfortunately, the minute they do that, um, they're subject to them for a day. They do subject to the um, post-employment restrictions. Okay. So a question here. Thank you. Uh, from our WebEx participants, we have a question that asks, as a SUNY university, we have student workers who work up to 29 hours per week while school is in session. Does this mean the two-year bar would apply to them if they meet the other three stipulations? Well, again, we could look at 0902 and say, we have to look, I, I would say we have to look at why are they working 29 hours? Is it mandatory? Is it not? And again, it's not necessary to hit all four, so I wouldn't say across the board the answer has to be no. But we would look at it. We would also look at why are they working 29 hours. If it has anything to do with their student study, we have a case that says that would be a way around that. I, I do think the way you're going more the other direction if you're working 29 hours for no reason at all except for you want to work 29 hours. If you look less like a full-time student and, and more like a, an employee with that case. Yeah, <laughs> you're a part-time student and a full-time employee. Um, so, although it's not a checklist, I would certainly look at 0902 and, and also rely on the fact that they were looking and really focusing on the fact that it was a mandatory three day um, and it was a mandatory test, test that they got. So, I was looking towards the answer that would disqualify them. We would certainly look at it. Again, it was not a checklist, but I, I would have to know why they're working 29, 29 hours. So, this would be an example of a situation that is specific enough that would require further guidance from the JCO firm. Right. Right. Nation. Call, on. call on you guys. Call on. Okay. We actually welcome uh, requests for formal opinions because it, it does, uh, we just issued one about which, which um, just came out, which uh, talks about who your former agencies are. And we tried to take all the one, all the uh, former advisors that we had in private kind of put in a bunch of factors to look at. So we actually welcome, we would love some more on post-employment, to be honest, because it is tricky, especially lifetime bar issues, very difficult. Uh, it would be wonderful to have the opportunity to try to um, clarify for everyone uh, what's a lifetime bar, what's an appearance. Um, we actually welcome that. So, you know, that might be a, a formal opinion request that we would, we would love to get to, to, to really even, I, I do think that the, what we have on full-time employees and even the 30-day rule, all those things are fairly uh, self-explanatory, but there's always room for the next question. So we welcome that. Um, I think we have one more question on this that I had. Uh, assuming the answer is yes, so this graduate that the student has now graduated, wants to continue with DOT, while they're looking for a job. And, so, and we just said, yes, that unfortunately you're out of the exception. You're, you're going to have to put deployment uh, restrictions in place by means that next day. So assuming the answer is yes, can the exception to your ban be granted on a case-by-case -case basis? Can we can we get a, a blank, almost like a blanket exemption for, and at this point now? There is no, no avenue for that. Uh, the only way around it is what John alluded to before, is that if that person became so who integral to DOT while they were um, a full-time student, whatever they were doing, you can ask for this A-B exemption, which John alluded to before, and then, you know, we don't give them out freely, but if that person had something that DOT absolutely needed and they were in charge of some project that needed to be completed and that person was, that student was apparently very involved in it, you could always ask for an A-B exemption for that one particular student. It would not be a blanket exemption. There is no no such thing. There's no such blanket waiver that we give. 
So that's it on the students. That's it on the 30 day, but I'm sure, I don't know if John's doing, you're going to come, we have some more questions, but I don't know if anyone has any more questions specifically on those two topics, the student exception and the 30 day rule. We can take those now, and if not, we have more post employment schedules. Love it. Love it. All right. <laughs> okay. Not this one. Hold on tight. Look at this last year. <laughs> All right. We got some questions on the um, the government to government exception and what qualifies. Before there even was a government to government exception in the law, the concept was articulated in one of the earlier opinions talking about the evil to be avoided, and that if someone is actually still serving the interests of the state by working for a local, another state agency, a federal agency, that the post-employment restrictions make no sense. They're still serving the public purpose. This is the principle articulated in 89.5 that was later codified in 73.8e. It says that the post-employment restrictions shall not apply person is performing their duties as an elected official or employee of a federal, state, or local government or one of its agents. So then the question becomes, what is a governmental entity? Which is not always so clear. One of the exceptions that they've carved out is for closely affiliated entities. Some of you know there are five statutorily created closely affiliated entities. They're essentially the research arms of OMH, DOH. They're in the finance law, uh, 53A. Youth Research Incorporated, the Research Foundation for Mental Hygiene, Health Research Inc., the Research Foundation for the State University of New York, and the Welfare Research there are several advisory opinions before 9502 that talk about how these are not state agencies. These closely affiliated entities are not state agencies and these employees are not state employees. But then they had a circumstance where someone wanted to go from their agency to the closely affiliated agency. So they carved out this exception. So it's not a state agency except when it is a state agency. And under this very limited circumstance, where someone is going from their agency to its closely affiliated agency, we're going to say they're exempt. The equivalent of the government to government exception is going to apply to that. They're still serving a public purpose. These two entities are so closely related in how they operate and the mission that they serve and perform that we can carve out this narrow exception. But did they ever make it narrow? Then you have 9517. This was an instance where somebody wanted to go from a state agency to the closely affiliated entity of a different state agency. So they're working for SUNY, they want to go work for DOH's closely affiliated entity. No, you can't do that. This was intended to be a narrow exception, and the only circumstances in where it applies is when you're traveling from your agency to its closely affiliated entity. The important thing to note about this exception, though, is it tolls the running of the two-year post-employment restriction. So in other words, you can't be sitting at DOH and saying, really, I don't want to be bound by this two-year bar. So I'm going to go cool my heels at the closely affiliated entity and let that clock run. If that's not a state agency, i got cases that say it, and then I'm going to go out in the world and I'm going to appear before DOH. The post employment restrictions will start to run when you leave that closely affiliated entity. That's the other half of that coin. That's the downside of doing that. The post employment restrictions kick in when you leave the closely affiliated entity. Okay. All right. What is a governmental entity? Not always so clear. We have 9615. This is the New York State Association of Counties. 
a nonprofit corporation comprised of county government that's actually authorized by county law. It's operated up with government funds. But the commission concluded it's not a governmental entity. It's essentially a lobbyist. And therefore, the government-to-government -government exception would not apply. There's actually a dissent in this opinion. There, is a universe, there wasn't universal agreement about whether or not this constitutes a governmental entity. There was a strong word of dissent, but it's still serving a public purpose. It's authorized by statute. It's federal funds. It looks enough like a duck to call it a duck. Government would apply. Then you have 9616 right afterwards. They look at the New England Interstate Water Pollution Control Commission. This is an interstate commission established by a compact between the several states. It's funded by the federal government. So it's statutorily created, federally funded, looking a lot like the Association of Counties, except it has the ability to exercise sovereign power in the sense that it set, has the ability to set water standards and it's forced to apply them on the various states by virtue of this compact. So because it had that extra element of exercising sovereign power, it said it was sufficiently governmental so that someone could lead New York State service, go serve on that commission, and they wouldn't be violating the post-employment restrictions because it was sufficiently governmental. This is just another case where they're dicing out what is or is not. And it's, an, it's another federally created entity where they said, yes, it's serving a public purpose, it's sufficiently governmental, that they're going to apply the government to government exception. So it's always, it's an open question sometimes what constitutes a governmental entity. It could be another instance where you'd want to turn to us. John, uh, can you go back to the Association of Counties question? Mm -hmm. I thought at some point, and maybe it's within that opinion, there was a question of whether Association of County employees were eligible for state Correct. They were. In fact, they were. They participated. That was one of the elements that the dissent argued. Made it government. These people were eligible to participate in the employee retirement system. One more thing that made it look like a duck, and quack like a duck, so why isn't it a governmental entity? And what they hung their hat on was this notion that, well, all they can really do is make recommendations, and nobody's bound by them. And they're essentially a lobby group, lobbying for the interests of the county. Yeah, I, again, some of these distinctions seem pretty arbitrary. If you have more questions, we can do that. I apologize. That's how I said we. Yes, I think you're right. <laughs> um, so, in the interest of respecting time, uh, we have reached the maximum time. So we're going to end our session here.